going. Um, today we've, we've got Max Miro, also known as the entrepreneur here. Um, so he's gonna be sharing his story of becoming an entrepreneur. Um, Max is an uh, educator or, or for entrepreneurship online. He's got his Twitch channel where um, he streams um, building uh, different websites or he's, he's always doing other, something entrepreneurial in there. Um, but yeah, I can, I can let him take it from here. Uh, at the end of the workshop, we are, or throughout the workshop, um, if you wanna leave some feedback on it, um, I will drop that in the chat. Just, um, you'll have the chance to uh, win some prizes. So please fill out and let us know what you think. Right. Here you go, Max. Cool, hello. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Is everything good? Sweet. Yeah. We can hear you. Everything. Neato. Um, yes. Hello. So I do a lot of presentations here. I, I love presenting for, for this group. Um, uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you, Patrick. I have a little live show called Entrepreneur and I build tiny little businesses on live streams. It's a whole lot of fun. Um, and uh, that's kind of my thing. And, and I, I teach, it a lot, teach it a lot of universities. Um, I've spoken at a bunch in the past year or so and only just started doing that. And uh, I am now recently um, reasonably popular on TikTok. So that's a new cool thing that I was trying out and it's going okay. Uh, but yeah, would love to talk all about my, I'm kind of gonna be going over my story. I love questions. If you have any questions, I'll have the chat up. Um, so I will see your question. I will answer your question. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna kind of walk through what I've done thus far and, and kind of how that's, that's uh, built me. I mean, I'm not like immensely impressive. I, I just got to the point where I'm full-time on my, my personal projects and it's very, very exciting, but I've tried a whole bunch of different little things along the way. Hello, Crystal, good to see you too. Um, I've tried a bunch of different little things along the way and most have failed, a lot have worked and, and I am now at the point where I am almost full-time. I, I just have to like move some freelance stuff around so I'm not doing any of that anymore. And then I'm basically just kind of totally independent which is very, very, very exciting. Um, so I think it's a great time to, to blab about it, but I'm not like, I'm not like a, like a, like some incredible multimillionaire killing it. Yeah. I'm just a kid that's building things and it's going great. So yeah. Awesome. Um, any questions on anything about me generally? I know I haven't really said too much about myself, but any questions just to start, maybe you've attended previous things or you have a couple of ideas or maybe you're building something yourself and you would love to talk about it. would love to hear anything. No pressure. Awesome. I'm kind of just curious, how old are you? Great question. Uh, I turned 24 this past summer, so I'm only 24. Awesome. Well, only. I mean, it still feels old. <laughs> Max, I was wondering, can you give us a little information about how you got started? Like your, a little bit of your entrepreneurial journey? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, that's what I, I want to go over. Um, I, so we'll just jump right into it. Uh, I, uh, I guess it kind of started um, in high school, sort of. I didn't really understand. I had no idea what entrepreneurship meant until like halfway through college, um, probably a little bit further than halfway through college. I, had no, I genuinely had no idea what entrepreneurship meant. All, all I knew was like entrepreneurs build companies. Like, what does that mean? Like, that's cool. But like, what does that mean? I had absolutely no idea beyond like the, the general kind of accepted term of like, you make a thing. Um, and even then I thought it was specifically like people that built like really huge companies and, and people that like, I, I just didn't fully understand what it kind of meant. But in high school was kind of my first little touch in entrepreneurship. Basically my, my dad helped immensely with this. My dad more or less put all of the resources and effort into it. I put a good amount of effort into it, but he put all the resources into it. We, me and my dad, as lame as this sounds now, it was very cool back in the day. We practiced parkour which is the thing where you run up walls and you climb stuff and you do flips and whatever, right? Not cool anymore. Was very cool then, I promise. And uh, before the office made fun of it, I feel like that was the point when parkour did stopped becoming cool when the office uh, dunked on it. Um, anyway, so uh, we loved parkour, super into it. It kind of was a thing uh, among a few different little kids in our school. And it was, it was just, you know, it was the hype thing of the day. We talked to, I talked to the, the board of the school and, and the principal and everything else and the, the athletic advisor. It was a very tiny school. It was like 160 kids overall, not just my class, but overall. Very, very tiny school in the middle of nowhere. I talked to the, the principal and I was like, hey, can I use the back gym? We don't really use it for much at all. 
it's like the old gym that we have. We don't really like nothing really goes on. There's a few little activities, but can we use like the stage up there that's no longer in use for like a little private parkour gym? And they were like, sure. Uh, and so my dad and I, mostly my dad bought a bunch of materials, like old mats that we found online, um, like big crash mats, big fluffy things you can jump into. Um, uh, vault tables we had some stuff built we put up big panels on the walls and made like climbing walls it was super super cool um again at the time uh and we just made a little class and i ran the class and i taught the kids and my dad just hung out and 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 helped teach some things and we just had a, a blast it was super super fun and we did that every tuesday and thursday for a while i charged for it a little bit in the beginning and then decided it would just be more fun if it was free um i didn't really care too much about making money off of it my dad's intention obviously with this was to give me experience like teaching things and like running something. And I had no idea at the time, I had no concept that that was entrepreneurship. It kind of sort of was, but it was just like doing something independently, right? And it was really, really fun. And it was basically how I learned to talk to people because I was homeschooled my entire life until high school. So I could not talk to people. And then I basically had like a nice environment where I was teaching um, and I knew how to teach well because uh, I think I had tutored kids when I was younger. Um, so it gave me like a really nice comfortable zone to like talk to people and make friends. And then I actually learned how to talk to people and people didn't think I, uh, uh, I was weird and I had friends now, yay. So it really saved my high school career, really, really fun. That was basically the first thing that I did that was even remotely entrepreneurial at all. I was never artistic. I was never, I was, I was, I, I liked math. Like I, nothing that I did was remotely entrepreneurial before that. Um, and then there was nothing because I, at the end of my junior year, I did that for about two years. And then at the end of my junior year, I moved to another high school. Um, and uh, from then the next three years, I essentially did nothing remotely entrepreneurial whatsoever at all. I still had no concept of what it meant. I, I ran that little class and that was super fun, but like I didn't build anything. I, I had no concept of anything. Um, but I went to school, a business school, and I took a track in entrepreneurship because I assumed that that would be very exciting. And my dad was very excited for me to be an entrepreneur. He was all pushing me into it. And, and I'm glad that he did, um, but he very much wanted me to kind of go that direction. Um, and uh, still had no concept, but I signed myself up and I was in a business course, a business major with a focus in entrepreneurship. Started taking classes, just typical business classes. They were fine, learned cool things, statistics, yay. Um, uh, and I couldn't take actual entrepreneurship courses in my major until the end of my junior year. So up until my sophomore year, I was basically just like trying to make friends, attempting to talk to girls, just doing stuff, college stuff, right? I, I like, I still, everybody was making fun of me too. All my friends would make fun of me. Like, what major are you? And I'm like, well, I'm a business major with a focus on entrepreneurship. And they're like, what does that mean? And I'm like, I don't really know. And they're like, aha. And they just, they thought it was super stupid. And um, of course later they didn't, but whatever. But it, like people that were in like physics or, or nobody was actually like dunking on me. Nobody was mean about it. They were just kind of like a ah, business kid, right? It wasn't an issue, but it was just a thing. It was a meme, right? I didn't really care. Um, everybody teases me for anything. That's how me and my friends all get along. I'm very, I'm very teasable. Um, so I, nobody knew, I didn't know, whatever. And then at the end of my sophomore year, I remember the moment I was sitting, I was bored. I finished all my homework. I was sitting with my girlfriend at the time. She was doing a ton of work because she was always overworked. Um, she was an architecture student. We were sitting in a computer lab, just hanging out um, while she was doing work and I was just finding things to pass the time. And uh, I suddenly had a very random burst of inspiration. And I was like, you know what? If I don't get to learn entrepreneurship in school yet, then I should go and I should talk to people that are doing it. So I hopped on, I did a little bit of my preliminary research. My dad had sent me a few links about like the, the local incubator at my school. There was a thing called Project Olympus and I had kind of talked to people in that space and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, or at least I hadn't really talked to anybody, I'd just heard about them. But I hopped on that little Project Olympus website, my little local student incubator, and then found a couple of local incubators that I had also heard about. Um, I did a bit of Googling, of course, to find new ones. And I looked up, okay, what alumni of CMU, of my, my school, my alma mater, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, what people have built companies that have graduated? And I found a few of them. I found like three of them on this Project Olympus website, the local incubators, little schools website, right? So on that website, they had their emails listed, I think. Um, 
maybe I got creative and I found them. But I was just like, heck, it, I'm just going to I'm just going to shoot them an email. And so I shot three people emails. I shot like three different entrepreneurs that I found on that website. The only three that I could find on that website that were actively out there. And two of them got back to me and they were like, hey, sure. Uh, basically, all I said in the email was like, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm supposed to be taking entrepreneurship courses that it comes a little bit later, but I would like to like give my best shot to it earlier. Right. I don't know what I'm doing. Can I sit down with you for like half an hour? Um, and two of them responded and they were like, sure. And one of them, I have tried emailing her a billion times and she's just too busy. So I've never actually gotten in touch with her. I saw her one time at like one event. She's just too cool. Um, but I talked to the two. We had a ton of fun. Uh, I was nervous as heck. I brought a tiny, literally a tiny little red book that's like smaller than my phone. It was a little red notebook because I just thought it was funny. And I wrote an insane amount of notes. I wrote every single thing that I heard down in those little notebooks. Um, uh, and then at the end, I asked each of them, is there anybody else you recommend I go and talk to? Um, and they recommended like a few other people. They were like, yeah, you should go talk to this other entrepreneur. I think that would actually be really, really helpful for you. Um, a couple of them gave me some tools. A couple of them were just like, yeah, I, don't know, I just started things. Like, but I, I asked the questions around like, how did you start your thing? What was the first step that you made? Um, what inspired you to create these things? Like the typical questions you kind of ask an entrepreneur. But I was really interested in like, what actually happens? Like, what is A, B, and C? What is step one, two, and three? You know what I mean? Because I had no idea. I like I like I wanted to like start a thing, but I was like, what what is the what do you do? And so I ended up over the next year and a half, especially that summer, that coming summer, because I was it was just at the end of my sophomore year. I ended up interviewing like 50-ish different entrepreneurs, all in different industries. Sometimes I would have like two different interviews per day. Um my dad was super excited about it. He's like, you're learning entrepreneurship. And I, I just felt like I was building a network and it was just generally really cool and helpful. And I was very excited about it. And I met a lot of really cool people and they told me a lot of cool things. And some of the interviews were absolutely useless. And they were just being like people being very like bragging about what they do. And a lot of them were really, really helpful where they actually gave me like, this is the tool that I use to find emails. This is the tool that I use to, to reach out to customers. Here are what my emails look like. Let me forward you one. This is how I reach out to people. Um, this is a tool that I use to build websites. Go check it out, right? Some of them were like unbelievably helpful. They knew exactly what I needed. A lot of them were just like people bragging about the cool things that they did and it didn't help me at all. But generally I learned what entrepreneurship roughly meant, right? Um, I, I asked, I learned to get better at asking questions. I figured out after like my, my 20th interview that, no, it was like my 50th interview. I talked to this one guy and he's still a really good friend of mine. He's so cool. Um, his name is David Cristello and he runs a company called Jetpack Workflow. It's like the most boring thing you've ever heard. It's a software company to help accounting firms be more effective internally. Like it's a to-do list for accountants in accounting firms, right? Like the least sexy thing you've ever heard of in your entire life. He's killing it. He's only raised a little bit of money. He doesn't really take money because he's doing so fine on his own. The way he expressed it to me, and this was like, like a huge brain opening moment. He was like, I'm going to give you three examples of how people started companies that I know, people, friends of mine. Um, the first one, I think I only remember two. Um, the first one was uh, one of my friends, a friend of mine, went and he was just driving along. He was driving along the side of the road or his friend was driving and he was just sitting in shotgun in the passenger seat. He looked over to his right and he saw a train rolling by. And on that train, uh, like half the cars were empty. There were just empty slots in the cars and then there were, you know, spaced out little things full of like coal or whatever the heck, right? Logs. So I think it was logs. I think it was like a logging uh, train. So it was just transporting materials, raw resources, and like half of it was empty. And he was like, huh, that seems inefficient. And so he went to, he looked up that train route and what trains typically run on those routes, right? And he found the company that runs it. Um, and he said, he emailed that company, he hopped on a call with them. He's like, hey, if I somehow was able to find uh, more resources for you to transport, could I, like, how much would it take for me to, like, transport those resources if I just had a ton? And they were like, oh, well, we'd, we'd transport it for, like, six cents a pound here to there, right? It's, like, thousands and millions of pounds, so it's, like, it adds up, right? He didn't have any resources. Um, so he was like, okay, cool, interesting, very cool. 
And then he went along that route and he looked up a bunch of different like logging companies that own those jurisdictions or something along those lines. He just, he found the resources along that route that might make sense. And he emailed those companies and he was like, yo, what up? Uh, do you need to transport your stuff from here to here? And he just did a ton of different interviews and talked to a ton of people and he found some people that needed to. And they were like, yeah, we'll pay like 12 cents per pound if we can do that. And he was like, sweet. And so he just was the middleman between those two people. And he made a business out of that, right? Like he didn't own anything. He just made a business out of making those connections. They just thought he was the person that did the shipping or owned the resources. He was just the middleman for that interaction. And that blew my mind, right? I was like, what? Like, that's not even a product. So that was one. I don't remember what the third one was, but the second one really blew me away. That like the second one is, is like how I got like the idea partially for my startup landing pages, like that little presentation that I give a lot. Basically what he said is one of his friends um, was really excited about this new health food. It was chicken bone broth. It wasn't just chicken broth, it was chicken bone broth. Very excited about it. Um, and uh, he was like, well, I wanna start a business with chicken bone broth. And so he didn't go and he started cooking anything. He didn't do anything like that. He just built a little website. It says buy chicken bone broth now. And this was right at the, like the right before it was like a widely accepted health food. Like now I can find chicken bone broth in stores. Like it's a common thing, but this was like just when it was getting started and he had learned about it because he just knew people and he'd tried it himself and he really, really liked it. And he was like, ah, you know what? I'm just going to put it up on a website, buy chicken bone broth. Now and he just made it look like a typical little e-commerce website. And behind that button, it said, buy now. It said, Hey, we're getting that first shipment ready. We'd love to grab your email. And if you've ever attended any of my other previous presentations, this sounds extremely familiar. This is where I got the majority of the idea. Um, uh, we'd love to grab your email and we'll email you when the product is ready to ship, right? We're still manufacturing. We're still packaging the first, you know, uh, shipment of bone broth. And the dude got like, he did a little bit of marketing for it. I had no idea what marketing was. So I, I, I had to come up with the rest of that in terms of like how I use that in, in my presentations, but he marketed it appropriately to the right places and like a hundred to a thousand people signed up for this awesome bone broth at the price that he had decided that he had put on that website. Right. He had no bone broth. Now he was going to go get bone broth. He found a manufacturer. He found a place. He started like trying to build it on his own, whatever he could do to resell or create his own bone broth. He now had all the customers that wanted that product. And he was like, all right, cool. Let's, let's make it happen. Right. And to me, I was like, holy heck, like that's, that exploded my brain right there. Like that one little story was so relevant and so specific. And I like, like David just like, he blew my mind with that one little, little story. Um, and it was exactly what I wanted to hear. And he only had like 20 minutes. He just unloaded a ton of information. It was like one of my shortest meetings. Um, uh, yeah, that boy, that boy has changed my life. But like, hearing those two stories just I was like oh my gosh now it makes sense like that was like the last little piece that I needed to go from generally understanding you solve a problem in the world to the steps the a b and c the one two and three of how can I immediately get this started right um so I was super excited and I think at that point that interview was the one that got me the confidence and helped me understand what I needed to do next to build a thing Right. And then I built, it was after my like 60th or 50th interview. Then I built my first ever little project. I was at the end of my junior year. It was called Yes PGH. And I snagged that domain name. I was very excited about it. It was an original idea. It was not an original idea whatsoever at all. I knew a guy because one of the interviews that I conducted was this guy, Brian Forrester. I think. I think it was Brian. Maybe Brian introduced me. Um, Brian was like one of the first people I ever knew as well. Um, basically what they were running was this little thing called Yes PDX. PDX is the, like, just like PGH is the three letter code for Pittsburgh. PDX is the three letter code for, I think like the airport uh, um, for Portland, Portland, Oregon, which is where I lived at the time. Um, and Yes PDX stood for Young Entrepreneurs Society of Portland. And I was like, holy crap, that's so cool. Right. Um, and basically all I did is it just, they just hosted little local events to help students 
that were interested in entrepreneurship get connected to the overall community. And there were, Portland is a huge college town as well as Pittsburgh. Like they just, there's a tiny little universities and schools and colleges and community colleges locally that are just like kind of have something going on, right? Um, but they never really had like an entrepreneurship program. So we made that little group. It was one of many, I think, or maybe it was originally his thing. I don't remember. But I was like, that is super cool. Could I steal that idea? And they were like, I don't, whatever. Yeah, go. Like, I just want kids to be interested in entrepreneurship. And I was like, me too. And so I was just like, I stole the name and I called it YesPGH. And I found the domain name YesPGH.com, snagged it and kind of made it a little bit of my own thing. Like I ended up, did, I did end up hosting events and getting people and, and having them like interview local entrepreneurs. And I ended up kind of doing similar programming. But the main idea was just like, it's a community. It's a Facebook group. It's a meetup group. It kind of went places. We hosted events. It was cool. I think I hosted three events over like a period of a year. And I met some really cool people through it. It was really awesome. I did some presentations on it. Very, very exciting. It was my first ever thing. And the main thing behind it was just a little Wix website. I spun it, I spun it up in uh, two days over a weekend. I remember doing it while uh, my girlfriend was in like, uh, uh, she was just doing a ton of work in her, what was it called? It's like the creative lab studio in studio for architecture. She was just in studio and I couldn't hang out because everybody was just working together really aggressively. So I just sat outside and I just worked on uh, my computer just building this thing. I'm so excited about it. I built a little website. I linked the, it's such a dumb looking website. I wish I could find it. Oh, I bet I could. Oh, I bet the Wayback Machine. <sighs> Whatever. Um, I got to look into that. I linked the Facebook group. The Facebook group went nowhere. I linked the meetup group. The meetup group kind of went somewhere and somebody ended up taking it over later and doing some dumb stuff to it. Um, but uh, I linked both of those. And then the main thing was just, this is a newsletter. I know all these companies that I've talked to and interviewed, right? This is the problem that I thought I was solving because I knew I needed to solve a problem. I saw all these different companies that I was interviewing need interns. They were always asking me like, you're a student. You know any interns that need internships? And I was like, no. And then I talked to a bunch of my friends and people that I knew and they, they were like, I don't know how to find internships. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, so I was like, okay, I'll make a little newsletter maybe to make this kind of connection, right? I'll post these internship opportunities on this newsletter and recommend the students that are on my, my newsletter list, right? And that was all the website was. It was just Facebook group, meetup group, sign up button for a MailChimp thing. I use MailChimp as just a little free newsletter tool and I popped it on the Wix website through a button and had people sign up. And I was like, I'm, I'm thinking back now, I haven't like reminisced this hard in a while. Like just putting that little MailChimp button on Wix and getting that to work. Like it took like five minutes to figure out, right? But just like putting that on there, I was like, oh my God, this is a website. This is a product. Like I was like, oh, I was so excited about it. Um, ah, yes, the good old days. Um, so I did that, published the website, yespgh.com. Super pumped about it, wonderful. Didn't really know what to do. Just talked to some friends about it and a few people signed up. And I was like, cool. Uh, and over the next like year, I just mentioned it to people casually. There was no real marketing behind it. It was just whenever I would go to a place, I would maybe give a presentation on it. Whenever I would uh, like go to a class, I talked to a few classes and I was like, hey, I'm building this thing. And I talked to my entrepreneurship professors and they were like, you should talk in our classes too. And I was like, sure. And I went and like to different places and just talked about it as much as I could. And after like a year of working on it, I got 93 signups, I think. Um, maybe it was just tipped over hundred towards the end, but I think it was like 93 or 97. Really like not a big number, right? Not a big number. But uh, a few of my friends got it. Like one of my friends that I'm like best friends with now got an internship uh, for a summer through that program, uh, through my little SPGH thing. A few other people that I talked to also found internships through that program. I think it was like three, the, the total was three. Um, three people found internships through my little site. I didn't get paid for anything. I think right towards the end, somebody was offering to pay me a hundred bucks to post it on my little website. And I was very excited about it, but I never ended up doing it because I think I just didn't like, I hadn't posted anything in such a long time. Um, but that was super exciting. And that was the first thing that I ever built. And it petered out after about a year because I just didn't stick with it. And I was too distracted because the summer after I did that, I finished it and, and completed it and had the most progress with it my junior year, end of my junior year when I built it, right? And then that next summer, I was so excited that I could build a thing and that it would work that I spent my entire summer, I had two internships. I had two internships, two part-time internships that I was supposed to be doing a lot of stuff at. 
I did basically nothing at those internships. And I spent almost all of my time meeting other entrepreneurs and networking with them and just, you know, interviewing more people because I was still really in, in the, the vibe of it. And then trying like seven different things at once because I had seven different business ideas that I was all building. And I was like, it only took me a weekend to build the last one. I can surely build like seven in the summer and I got nothing done. I absolutely got nothing done on my internships. I learned a bunch about building things, but I never got any of the actual products that I wanted to get done finished, um, which is a shame. But um, I had a ton of fun. It was very exciting. I learned a ton from every single one of those little failures. And one of the things that I did end up start, that I did start doing roughly is I started posting on LinkedIn. Because while I was on LinkedIn, I spent a lot of time on LinkedIn just like connecting with the people that I had like interviewed, right? Because I just wanted to build a network roughly, whatever that means. Um, and while I was doing that, I randomly came across this video of a fella named John Fry. Um, still a friend of mine. Uh, he's doing amazing things. He was posting videos on LinkedIn, like a social media platform. And I was like, what the heck is this? And this was back in 20. 18, I guess. Um, uh, I was like 20 years old, maybe 21. Um, yes, I was 21. I was 21. I just turned 21 that summer. Um, anyway, doing that. Wonderful. Yay. Yeehaw. Uh, I saw him posting these things and I was like, that sounds like a really cool guy to interview. And so I reached out to him over LinkedIn. I was like, why can we hop on a call? He was like, sure. And he explained to me that at that time, LinkedIn was uh, an underserved social media platform because nobody uses a social media platform. Everybody just uses like a private resume, right? That's still mostly how it's used. But now if you've realized like in the past few years, LinkedIn, everybody posts on LinkedIn or a lot of professionals do at least and it's become this big thing, right? And so at the time, there were so few people making videos on LinkedIn that anytime you made a video, everybody would see it. Not everybody, but like everybody in your extended network would see it. And that's how I saw John Fry. I had no, I had just like the remotest connection to this guy and that I still saw his video. So he was telling me about how much opportunity is on the platform to make things. I got very excited. I was like, that's super cool. Thank you for telling me that. I would love to like learn more. And I interviewed him over the next like half hour. I can't remember where I interviewed him from. Um, but yeah, it was very exciting. I was having a ton of fun. Um, so after that, I got super hype and I was like, that's another thing I should try. I should try posting on LinkedIn. I should try posting on social media and seeing if I could build a following on this professional platform. That sounds super interesting. And I made videos and they were dumb videos. Like they were bad. Like if I look back now, I would not be able to actually physically watch them because I would just cringe so much, like terrible. At the time I was also not super into them. Uh, but now I would be horrified. Like, uh, I can't, I cannot emotionally deal with the concept of, of such a baby Max making such bad videos. Um, but I put them on there. It took me like a month to make and film my first video and actually publish it. Um, and uh, people loved it for some reason. Like people were really excited about it and they were like, you should make more videos. And like my first few videos didn't really do that well, but I got enough of like positive feedback that I was like, yeah, let's try it again. And the second video was 10 times easier than the last one. And the third video was like twice as easy as that one. And it just got easier and easier and easier and easier. And before I knew it, I was posting videos like three times a week, just like little things that I thought were cool. Tech tips, networking tips, because I was having all these cool interviews. Every time I would interview somebody, I would make a video or a post about it. And I got really pumped. Um, and I made my, some of my little interviews into kind of a series. Um, very interesting. Very cool. Kind of worked. People started to follow me. I started to gain a following and things were started to grow. Um, uh, and tons of people were commenting and liking on my posts. It was, it was very, very, it was the only thing that I had built that had like a ton of positive feedback. Yes, BGH was do, would, did well, right? Like people really liked it and I did get, get, it did work, but like seeing all these awesome positive comments on LinkedIn and on little posts that you make just like gives you a whole lot more of like to work with, right? You're like, oh my gosh, people love this, right? And I get immediate feedback and I got like ideas from, for next videos and like, you should make a video on this. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll make my next video on that. A lot of that. Very exciting. Um, none of it went anywhere, but I was starting to gain a small following after a little while. I think that summer I got to a thousand after like, from it being like 250, I got to like a thousand followers on LinkedIn. I was super pumped, very excited. And then 
I was building all these little things. And I can't remember what the next thing, I think, I don't think I actually built anything sufficiently or solidly uh, for a while. But as soon as I got back to college, after that summer, I had a really big, dumb idea. And I was like, what if, because the thing that has been teaching me the most, I've been failing at all these little startup ideas. I messed like seven up in one summer, but I learned so much about like SEO, about how to build websites, about product creation, about like the marketing process, about like, like all these cool, wonderful things. Um, even though I messed everything up, I was still learning a ton. And so I thought, okay, I don't think I'm actually going to get anything done with this, but I don't think I'm actually going to build anything like insanely huge or insanely successful. But what if, because the thing that's been most helpful to me in terms of actually learning entrepreneurship, what if I filmed me doing that and messing up with these little ideas and trying my best and bumbling through it like I have been, and I talked about what I'm learning because it's been so immensely huge for me. Like interviews have been great, but the that process of trying the SPGH like exploded my brain with possibilities. And the process of bumbling around and failing with all these little ideas exploded my brain with possibilities. And that was how I learned how actual entrepreneurship functioned. Um, so I thought like that was by far the most helpful thing. And by then I had actually taken courses on entrepreneurship. The courses were great. See, I mean, it was great courses on entrepreneurship. And I was very happy with them, but by, but by actually building something, it was way, way more like, like it just helped my brain get into the right headspace to like understand what I need to do to start something. Um, so I thought it'd be really, really helpful and really, really educational for people to see that, right? To work with me and fail and mess up and, and experience and, and build things with me. At the same time, I started that because I could not find anything on the internet. Um, any I didn't do tons of searching. I did a little bit of Googling. I did a little bit of um, Instagram searching, but like on social media, like I was exposed relatively well to like the entrepreneurship community and everything that I saw was kind of bad. Like I didn't know what I was talking about, but I, it sure as heck wasn't accurate stuff. Like it had nothing to do with actually solving problems or building things. It was just people in front of fancy cars being white and being men and being angry and greedy. And that was all it was. Like it wasn't, it was weird. Very, very weird. Very aggressive kind of community. I, I didn't understand it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Very funky. And so I thought, okay, well, if there's if nobody is like actually talking about real stuff, then maybe people don't want it, but also maybe people do want it. So if I make this this little channel of videos of me messing around, I feel like that would be really, really good educational like uh, content. And maybe people that actually care to learn things would be interested in it. Maybe there are other people like me. So I made the first little video. Um, it was just like a one minute video. It's somewhere on YouTube and it's somewhere on LinkedIn too. I posted it on LinkedIn primarily. And it was like intro to entrepreneur. I was like, I'm going to start a series of videos and it's going to go like this. I'm going to build little ideas in front of you. I actually, oh, wow. I think I filmed that video in this conference room. Ooh. Yeah, because this is a little entrepreneurship center. Oh my gosh, wow. Such a, such a, uh, uh, yeah, I think I did. Oh my God, I think I did. I think I filmed it right here. Oh, ooh, goosebumps. I love it. Um, so filmed it in the little entrepreneurship center in my university like a minute, 20 seconds. This is entrepreneur. I'm going to build, just film a little series of dumb videos. I'm going to try to post two per week on me trying to build stuff, right? The first thing that I'm going to try is a lemonade stand because that feels like the most bare form of entrepreneurship. And it got like 37,000 views. And that was by far the most successful post that I've ever made on, on LinkedIn ever. And that's like, it's, it's not, in terms of now, it's a lot. In terms of back then, it wasn't a lot. Um, in terms of like the actual amount of engagement that I got, it was like, it was just a, a good post. It was a really solid post. And a lot of people really liked it. And just the amount of positive feedback that I got on that post and all those views, I was like, my goodness, people must love this idea. Right. So I was very excited. Um, and that was the only thing that I did to launch and I should have done so much more. And then over the next year or so, um, I posted videos, one every Tuesday, one every Thursday. Uh, it was agonizing to do all that video editing. And I ended up giving a presentation on ESPGH and on my little series of videos. Um, I ended up uh, giving a presentation on that at a local high school program for entrepreneurship. Um, but I, I, I was making these little videos and I was at like video like 20 when I gave this presentation. I was talking about ESPGH and my general approach to entrepreneurship and building things. And I was so nervous. Um, and I talked and this kid came up to me, who's now one of my best, best friends, um, named Joe, Joe Mrozek. And I was just hanging out with him, I think yesterday, because I'm back in Pittsburgh. And uh, I 
just he's a video editor he makes a ton of really cool really funny video content on youtube and he's still figuring stuff out he's still bumbling around just like me um and he was like hey i really really like what you're doing is there any way we could work together and we just it wasn't even that it was just we should hang out um and so we just exchanged numbers exchanged emails talked over over once in a while and after a while we like had a couple of calls just to catch up he was like hey so like you're doing a lot of video editing right i'm like yes and he's like could i help with that at all and i was like yes you could and because he was so excited about the stuff that i was doing and because i had helped him i think find some other people we were just like we just really liked working with each other he did it for super cheap and he still does it for super cheap i haven't had him on a couple of videos lately but he just really really likes the stuff and now i've found him clients that like basically have him at full-time video editing like we're just we're really really close and we've worked together for years now but he then made the video editing process a lot better he, he edited my videos way better than i ever could um, and uh, he made it a lot easier for me so I could actually focus on filming the content as opposed to just editing the content, right? Very exciting for me. Very, very exciting. Um, it was really weird because like I had never paid anybody to do anything before and I had never outsourced anything. I'd always done everything myself because I kind of wanted to. But after I saw like the first video that he did, I was like, he's way better than me. This was such a good decision. This, he's just always going to be better me than this he's i will give him all my videos from from now on forever um and that's how it's worked and eventually after like episode like 50 it was just so frustrating to film these videos in these specific little time slots and like 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 script them out and things like that i just didn't like the format of scripting videos ironically now i kind of want to go back to it um uh, and like six people had seen my videos they loved my videos everybody in, in pittsburgh at least that was in a specific niche professional community was very excited about the things that I was doing and they liked all the videos and, and they just thought it was cool. And so like one time at one event, they rec somebody recognized me and I was like, oh, me is very funny. Um, it was by no means a big deal, but it felt like a big deal to me. Um, and after episode like 50, I had heard like six times that month that I should try live streaming because Twitch was becoming a big thing. And I was like, uh, sounds dumb. And I tried it and I was like, sure, everybody's, everybody's bugging me too. I might as well try it. And I loved it. And the first live stream I ever did was like four hours long, which is an agonizing amount of time. Um, and the only people that I hocked on were my friend, my best friend at the time, Andy, my mom, my dad. And I think that's it. That was just the people that I hung out with. And they had a ton of fun and I had a ton of fun. And it was really, really like great. And the next like 10 live streams that I did was basically just those people. And I think Joe hopped on one as well. Joe always hops on them, but that was all it was, right? Maximum four people just kind of hanging out. And like my parents couldn't even stay the whole time because like I was just, I was bad at it, right? It was really weird. It was fun. It was interesting, but like it, it's just a long time to be on a live stream and to hang out on somebody's like channel. <laughs> so did that. It wasn't as highly viewed as my videos on LinkedIn but I liked the format a whole lot more and it was way easier for me to make stuff. And I had a lot more time during those to actually make cool products and like try to do things. And for the first like year and a half of live streaming, cause it's been like two and a half years now or two years ish for the first like year, I was just going through like tips and cool things and having fun. And one time I tried to build something and it totally flopped and whatever. Um, and only about a year ago, did I get to the point where I was like, I need to build things better. And somebody introduced me to the concept of no code and all these cool no code tools that I use so regularly on my show and in these presentations. And I started playing around with um, tools like Card and tools like Adalo and all these really, really cool things to build apps and websites and tools and databases and, and payment buttons and integrations and all these different things. And I dove kind of headfirst into it. And over the past year, I've just gotten like, I've just spent more and more time building things. But as soon as I hit that point, I started to genuinely try ideas on my live stream. Um, and around that time, about a year ago, uh, I can't remember, I think it was it was the, uh, the rec. I don't know how I got connected. I can't freaking remember exactly how it happened. But I was talking to Tanya, I was talking to somebody at the rec about what I was doing. Uh, cause I think I wanted to reach out to more students or something, um, to see if they would be interested in my show. And it ended up getting to the point where they were like, would you be open to giving a presentation? 
I was like, sure. Um, and uh, I gave the presentation. I was incredibly nervous. Um, had a ton of fun with it. Talked with some kiddos, helped them build cool things. I think I talked about the landing page process and how that functions. Um, Cause I had done that a bunch on my show at that point. I was very, I was, I was well acquainted with it. And I, I pulled in a couple of different little marketing plans because I was trying to figure out how to market entrepreneur. I feel like I learned a bunch of different, like posting on different communities, that little strategy that I do. If you've ever seen my, my other presentations, I post to like Facebook groups and Reddit groups and, and forums online. That process of finding those was initially an attempt to market entrepreneur that kind of worked, but didn't really but it was fit perfectly for my little landing page process. And so I ended up incorporating into that, but that was the first presentation I ever get, I did, I think. And I think it was here um, at the rec. And then since then I had a lot of success with that. People really liked it. And I had a lot of fun and I was like, okay, interesting. So I started emailing and messaging hundreds of entrepreneurship professors on LinkedIn and eventually entrepreneurship directors. All while I was doing this was live streaming and experimenting and trying to get more people. And I thought that if I go and I present to these universities, um, that maybe some of the students would find me and they'd follow me and they'd hop on my live stream. And it didn't really work like that. People didn't really kind of follow me. It hasn't been like a, like a really successful kind of marketing thing. But suddenly like one or two people were like, what do you charge for these presentations? And I was like, charge. Um, and I said, I don't know, hundred bucks. And they were like, cool. And I was like, sweet. And so ever since then, like I, I, since then, whenever somebody asks to charge her, if it's a larger presentation, I give them a quote. And I'm like, this is what I've done before, right? And that's steadily, slowly, very, very slowly gone up over the past year. And now I've gotten to the point where I've messaged so many professors and so many directors that I have this big network of, of educators in the entrepreneurship space. Um, my live stream has slowly grown over time. I've experimented with different marketing campaigns and some of them have worked, some of them haven't, most of them haven't. Um, over the past year though, I've gotten to the point where now I think one of my recent presentations was at the Thurgood Marshall college fund. And it was like four hours of work for me. There are, there are really, really cool nonprofit that supports historically black colleges and universities. Um, I can't remember how I got connected to them either, but they paid me somewhere around like $1,600 to spend like four hours of work, like just present for four hours and help students do cool things. And that's the most that I've ever been paid for something like that. Um, it was like 500 ish an hour. And now like I do presentations and I have another presentation scheduled, uh, three presentations scheduled for in, in this really cool uh, college in Canada. And they're paying me 500 bucks an hour. Um, and like people just find me now or I find them and they pay me to speak. And I've gotten really, really good at these presentations because I've given them like tons of times. And at this point, I think I've spoken at 73 different universities uh, in 16 different countries and it's half of the money that I make per month that I need to like live um, doing these presentations. And it's unbelievably exciting. And like five months ago, the most recent attempt at marketing entrepreneurs, so that was all happening in the background. And I thought I could get to full-time on that. And that was very exciting. And it's, it's been a little bit harder to get to complete full-time on that. Um, the most recent marketing attempt that I have tried that has been shockingly successful has been TikTok. And people told me to get on TikTok ever since it started. Everybody on LinkedIn was so into TikTok ever since it started and everybody's really killing it there. I thought it was stupid because I thought there's no freaking chance that I can jam something actually educational where I normally spend 90 minutes in a live stream going over a concept. There's no way that I can jam that into 30 or even 60 seconds and genuinely make it educational. And I refuse to make entertainment content. I just, it's not my thing. I don't think I'm funny enough. I don't think I'm interesting enough. And also I just don't like it. It's not something that I personally watch. It's not my thing. So I refuse to make the typical content that succeeds well on TikTok, which is entertaining stuff, right? I wanted to make educational content. And I thought there's no freaking way that I could do that in a 60 second format at most, right? So for a year, I told people, no, it was stupid. And then five-ish months ago, I tried it. Um, well, and like a year ago, I tried it once and it didn't really do anything. I got like one video and it did really, it did like pretty decently well. I got like 1500 views and I was like, whoa, but like, <laughs> I still don't like it. And then I came up with an idea to make it because I was getting way into no code and I had this giant no code list. I was like, what if I just make videos on these no code tools? Cause that way I'm just introdu introducing somebody to a tool but I'm not actually like teaching them a concept. It's still educational. It's kind of like a little bit on the line but it's way more educational than anything that's on the platform. And I can make a ton of videos about it cause I can make one per tool and there's like 400 tools that I've collected. And I was like, okay, that sounds like something I could do on TikTok. 
maybe Instagram reels as well. And I expected Instagram reels to go way better um, than uh, TikTok because I already had like 1500 followers there and I was doing decent from like marketing campaigns and experiments and random ideas. And um, uh, after like two weeks of posting on TikTok, one of my videos got like a few thousand views and like most of them just had like 300, 400, 500 views. And one of them got like a few thousand views. And I was like, whoa, it's like 5,000 views. And I was like, oh my God. And I got like a hundred followers from that, like 200 followers. And I was like, wow, that's some quick growth um, off of one video. And then like I made videos for like a week more and I got one that had like 11,000 views. And I was like, duh. And then over the past five months, I've worked my way up and I just, I, I'm at like 12.4 thousand followers now, which is not a lot, but like three months ago when I got to like, 5,000 followers ish, I think. Um, companies just randomly started reaching out to me and being like, yo, can we pay you a hundred bucks to make a TikTok? And I was like, sure. And now I get paid like 250 bucks a TikTok. And like, I have like a pipeline and I've worked with companies like Zapier or Zapier. Uh, and, and they're like one of my favorite companies in the world. Like I, uh, and now it's half of my revenue. That first half is speaking that I thought I would be able to scale, but I couldn't scale quite as fast as I needed to. But now I'm half of it's TikTok. And now based on those two things, I think I am full-time. And I've just reached that point basically this month. Um, and I'm at the end of the month, I'm gonna try to do a whole lot less freelance and work almost entirely on just my own stuff. Um, yeah, and that's the point that I have reached. And it's very exciting. And we're, I'm hoping that I can just spend all of my dang time building stupid ideas. Um, yeah, that's more or less my entire story, I think in the most in-depth process that I've ever told it in. So I would love to know if there are any questions or if any of that made sense or if you have any ideas, yeah. Oh, that was great. Thank you, Max. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And it was really amazing to see your journey and all the ups and downs. I mean, it's truly what we hear and see from other entrepreneurs, you know, that it's, it's definitely, you get what you put in it and um, definitely highs and lows, but congrats. Yes, um, thank you so much. I have a quick question. How did the pandemic affect entrepreneur? Great question. Yeah. So the pandemic hit right as I kind of started live streaming ish or around then. And honestly, I was like, sweet. Like I, like, I wasn't like sweet, like people are dying. Like it's, it's absolutely terrible what's going on. And, and it is, it, it's been the worst thing that's happened in, in our, our recent history. But like, in terms of like what I had to do, I was like, I'm pretty well positioned because I just sit at home and make videos. Like, like it doesn't, I'm very, very lucky in the sense that it doesn't actually affect my business so far. So in the beginning, that's what it was. Um, recently, in the past year or so, um, it's actually been also in a weird way, fine. Because I don't have to be, prior to the, the pandemic, nobody did any virtual presentations in colleges, right? It, it sometimes happened if it was like a really amazing person and they just couldn't travel out. But other than that, it never really was a thing. But the reason that I've been able to speak it in 16 different countries is because I, everybody was doing virtual anyway, right? So me, I was just as good as anybody else suddenly. And like the things that I taught, which tend, they turned out to be pretty valuable. So it's helped me immensely in terms of like the accessibility of my, like what I have to do to get into a university to build that kind of speaking career is, is way lower. The barrier to entry is way, way lower. Um, so in terms of those two things, it's helped. Um, in terms of, uh, I had this one other company that I was working on before I moved, uh, well, before the pandemic actually, uh, called Moss Generation. I forgot to mention that. At the end of my college career, I didn't really have anything going on. Um, I like I had my little SPGH. I didn't it kind of petered out. I was trying to build things. I was making these videos. I was having a lot of fun, but it was it wasn't really like necessarily going anywhere. Like very exciting, and I felt really like a loser because I was like I don't have anything that I'm working on. That's a startup, and I'm graduating, and I'm like like what am I doing? For some reason, that was like worrisome to me. Um, and I met this guy named Andy Chan again, one of my best friends now, and one of my super best friends then. Um, he had invited a couple of people to come hang out together that were local entrepreneurs. And there ended up being people that I interviewed, right? Um, it was like five people. He didn't invite me, just a few of his friends. And then uh, he uh, 
um, the next time he did it, he invited like 10 people and everybody showed up and it was just entrepreneurs. And the next time he invited like 15 people and it turned into this like wonderful event that like took over this bar in a hotel and everybody was having a great time. And there were like, there were corporate people there that were like, we need to sponsor an event like this. And then suddenly it was a thing, right? And he had known that one of my ideas, especially with like SPGH was like to get entrepreneurs together and everybody kind of dumped on my idea that I talked to. Um, so it never really went anywhere. He just went and did it. And uh, he was like, hey, I know you really wanted to do something similar to this. He was just one of the people that I interviewed and we had met at a couple of events since then. He was like, would you be down to like, join me? And I was like, yes, like this is the most exciting thing ever. Holy crap, absolutely. And so I joined him and over like, that was my first like real startup. Um, and it was just an events company. We hosted cool events and we had a nice network of like around a hundred different really high quality, awesome entrepreneurs all in one place together. And people would sponsor those events and they'd pay us like a thousand bucks per event. They'd sponsor it for like 2000 and then they'd pay us like a thousand. There were free drinks, free food. It was really nice for all these, all these awesome entrepreneurs. That was like my first real startup. Um, I totally forgot to mention that. That would have been a great thing to mention when I was going over the whole thing. But um, that completely shut down and has been shut down since. We hosted an event like two months ago and it went okay. And we had to be really, really careful and safe. Like it's, it's, it's important. Like I, I wouldn't want it to be happening now. I, I don't care if I'm making money on it. Like it's, it's really, really important to shut those things down. So that was initially in terms of my plan going to be very much like half of my revenue full time. I was going to run that remotely and I was going to come back into town whenever. Um, and I can't do that anymore. It's just not a thing. Events are not a thing right now. And they probably won't be for a little while. Right. Um, so that affected me pretty negatively because it, it like significantly put a damper on how much revenue I was making from personal projects and what I was able to spend my time on. And so I had to take on a lot more freelance clients as a result during the pandemic. Um, and, uh, but other than that, it's been nothing. It hasn't really affected me at all. It's helped me present it more places and it's just content. So it never really affected me beyond that. But so entrepreneur wasn't directly affected, but Moss Generation, which is that, that events company was very directly affected. It had to shut down entirely. So yeah, great question. We've had a few questions since the, since the last one here. <clears throat> ben says, what is a great way to take notes or to stay motivated? Great question, Ben. Um, so uh, basically over this entire process, I have worked out like this system um, of like note taking and to-do list and like bits and like using my Google calendar. The two tools that I use like more than anything in my entire life are Todoist, it's just a little to-do list app. It's like basically everything else. There's nothing really insane about it. I use it on the free tier and I've used it forever on the free tier. I don't think I'll ever pay for it. I don't think I have a reason to. It's a very simple to-do list app. I've heard there are better ones. I've heard there are worse ones, whatever. I got on it really early because I just found it because one of the people that I interviewed was like, you got to use this app. Um, and I use it for everything. I put every single little to-do item, everything that I have to remember, even personal stuff. Like I, I was texting my girlfriend earlier today and I was like, hey, I have to tell you a story about your friend that I met while I was in Pittsburgh. And she was like, okay, I'll remind you when you get back. And I know she's going to forget. So I just put down on my little to-do list Wednesday, remind Nicole to tell, remind, well, tell Nicole the story that you, you wanted to remind her. And that anytime that I have to do anything, anytime I have to follow up on an email after like a, a, a like a month, anytime that somebody tells me they need something shot to them, anytime anything happens ever in my life at all, I put it on my to-do list. And that took a lot of practice. And anytime I have any meeting ever, I put it on my Google calendar. So I never forget anything ever. That's a lie. But like in terms of like generally, I'm, I'm highly effective at not forgetting to do things. And everybody's typically reasonably impressed because I follow up very consistently. I'm very like on the ball when it comes to getting stuff done. That took a lot of time to get to. That was a, pro a product of freelancing, a product of doing my own things, a product of everything. But I've, I, those are the two tools that I use. And it's just kind of figuring out what works best for you. Those two tools work beautifully for me right? Um, staying motivated. The only things that I've ever been able to work on are things that are really fun to me. So a lot of this was really, really fun to me. Um, so that helps me stay motivated. That's really all I can kind of say on that. I wish there was something special, but thank so you. Fun. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, well, the next question, Kristen says, what did you do differently with the post that got 37,000 views when you were launching? When you were launching, do you think the frequency of posting twice weekly diluted the views initially until your following grew? Uh, great question. Social media is absolutely random. Um, 
And I say that being somebody who's posted on there for three ish years, like it's even LinkedIn, LinkedIn is relatively predictable in terms of like TikTok is random. Like the LinkedIn compared to TikTok is relatively predictable there. It was just nice timing. Everybody was launching series in terms of my initial community on LinkedIn. It just happens to work really nicely. Posting twice weekly did not dilute the views. Being consistent on social media is by far the most important thing that you can do to build a following. So my posting twice weekly is what helped me grow. Um, the initial launch, don't know why it did so well. I was very excited about it. I didn't really tell many people about it. Um, I tagged a few people. I did just about what I do on every other post, but it happens to do well that one time. And I got really lucky. Um, genuinely, I post so many videos on TikTok. I post a video every single day on TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn now, right? The ones that do well, I do not expect to do well ever. I've never since I, there was one video that I posted. I'm like, I think this will do great. And it did great. And that I posted probably over a hundred videos and all the rest of them. I'm like, this one's going to do bad. And it does amazing. And then and another one I'll post. I'm like, this one's going to do excellent. And it does jack bad. Like it's awful. It's so unpredictable, especially on, on really populated platforms like TikTok or Instagram. And on LinkedIn at the time, it was just a little bit more random because things were, people were still figuring it out. Right. Don't know what happened pretty random, but it worked out. Um, Elijah says, what was the hardest thing you accomplished for you? Uh, hardest thing to accomplish for you during your journey? Uh, the hardest thing? Um, I think, I don't know. I think lately, uh, the biggest thing has just been like the pandemic has left a lot of people feeling kind of like gray inside. I've felt that a lot lately. Um, I talked to all my friends about this. It's like you're living in like black and white. It's like you are like there's an emotional ceiling or, or floor. Like you can't get really excited or really sad. Like there's a whole bunch of weird effects that have uh, emotional effects that have been happening to me and my friends and everybody that I've ever talked to um, about this for the past like two-ish years because of the pandemic, right? That is not necessarily a result of my work. Um, my work is a little bit weird because I like, there's always something more for me to be working on constantly. And so during that process, especially exacerbated by the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, I was struggling a little bit emotionally, uh, just finding a nice balance because at every moment of every day, I'm still able to convince myself that I should be working on something that might lead to future success, right? I should be trying something new. I should be emailing the next person. I should be building that list out a little bit further. I should be whatever, right? There's always something more you can do as an entrepreneur every single day, every single second. And so I struggled a little bit back and forth with that. Um, and it's good and bad. It motivates me to get stuff done. And that like that nervousness, that anxiety motivates me to get stuff done, but it's not healthy in the long term or when it kind of grows too much. And the pandemic again exacerbated that. That's probably been the hardest thing to get over. I've gotten better at work life balance. And now I take a lot more breaks and I'm very, very nice to myself and I goof off a lot and I'm still very productive. Um, but the emotional kind of weariness from such a visceral change in lifestyle from the pandemic, uh, has been, has left a toll on me and a lot of people that I know, and I'm still working through that. Um, and that's probably been the hardest thing so far, but, uh, early on, I would level, I would put it as, as the same kind of level of problematicness where I just, I was working way too much and I just, I was unhappy, right? Um, that was around after I graduated college. I lived alone. I just worked myself into the ground. Um, so yeah, that after college and now working through the emotional kind of toll of, of the pandemic and, and figuring out how to, how to like feel stuff a lot again. Um, me and my friends are all working through it, figuring it out. Probably the hardest thing that I've had to go through so far though. Yeah, it's a great question. I hope that is like a solid answer. Um, Kristen asks, have you run into any issues when showcasing the tools and any props in general for the actual companies themselves? Um, not really. Things have been pretty good. I, I'll run into technical issues occasionally. Technical issues are just inevitable when you're working with anything technology. Um, but like I practice beforehand. Like it's been pretty good to be totally honest. Um, there's always glitches. There's always mess ups. And it's, good, it's a good idea if you're making something to like not just wing it and like experiment a few times. Like all my TikTok videos, I probably filmed like four times because I always screw them up. Like I say something dumb and I'm like, that was dumb. And then I just, I'm say that while I, while I'm filming and then I restart the video, it takes me like four times to make every little video or every little thing. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just trial and error. And that's going to happen with technology. Ben says, any influencers based TikTokers influence you looked up to on, on or recommend yourself? 
no, I really haven't found anybody that I'm really, really pumped about. There's one professor, uh, Dave Skywalker on Twitch, good friend of mine. He like interviews DJs and entrepreneurs on his Twitch channel. He's like the only other person that I've seen. I'm like, yeah, this is so cool. There's like a few people. Oh, uh, there's a couple of people actually. No, 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 no. There, there are a couple of people. Um, look these names up. So it's going to be Dave Skywalker on Twitch. Wonderful professor. <clears throat> on Twitter, um, there is uh, what was it? Uh, Bad Unicorn um, on Twitter. Bad Unicorn on Twitter. They're like me, but they make really stupid ideas and they do them every two weeks. And the purpose is just to be funny. Um, and that's actually about it. Just those two. I, I, I look at a lot of stuff. I don't consume a ton of information on the internet, um, but I can't really find anybody that's really making really, really cool stuff. Um, yeah. I had a quick question. What one thing would you recommend for new student founders to do first in their startups? Since you've had so much experience with starting multiple startups. Great question. Yeah. Um, I think probably the biggest thing is email people. Um, if you want to do anything, like email your competitors, like I, like email anybody in any space that you want to get into, right? Um, like you need to. That's the, the biggest thing that has given me the biggest advantage ever in my entire life has 100% been if I have an issue or a question that I can't answer on Google or YouTube, I go to somebody that knows how to do it. So an entrepreneur in my case, if I, if I don't know how to start a product or I don't know how to start a website, I go to somebody that knows how to do it and I email them and I say, hey, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Can I can I like fawn over you for half an hour on the phone and like ask your advice? And so many people are down for that. And that has gotten me everything early on that I've ever needed. Um, like if you need to, if you want to ask me questions, just reach out to me. I, I mentor students all the time. Like I, I talked with two earlier today and it is something that I do often. I really enjoy it. Other startup founders are also very easy to reach. If you want to get an internship in engineering, you should talk to an engineer right? That started with an internship. You should look on their LinkedIn profile and see if they started as an intern and then went to a, an employee at the company, ask them how they did that, right? That is the number one thing. Shooting people emails and just asking for time is by far the number one thing that's been most helpful for me learning anything and getting anything done. Um, yeah, LinkedIn is incredibly powerful. Email is incredibly powerful. Those are the two things that I would say. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. We have another question from uh, Elijah here. Um, do you have any suggestions on where to start for someone trying to start a company? I kind of want to throw a second question onto that of um, how do you know which ideas are worth pursuing and, and which at which moment do you know that you can keep running with it or time to give up? Great question. I can answer both of those things with the same answer. Um, so the, the process that I use to test new startup ideas, right? Like uh, what I say for everybody starting a company ever is the, the first little step that I always recommend is make a website make it look legit. Don't say that it's like you're thinking about making this thing. Make it like it's real. Make that website look as real as humanly possible, like it exists already, right? Dropbox did this. Dropbox is a really, really huge company. We probably all use Dropbox at some point. It's like Google Drive for sharing files. They're like a billion dollar company. The first little thing that they did in their company was they built a website with a video on it that made it look like Dropbox was real. You share one little file here and it's, oh my gosh, it's over on the other computer. Ah, amazing technology didn't work. It wasn't real. It was fake. They just edited a video together, right? And they put a little waitlist button on there, like sign up with your email for the waitlist of the product, right? And they got like thousands of signups and that's how they built started a billion dollar company. Um, that process of just pretending your land, your, your, your product idea, your app, whatever the heck it is exists, first of all, gives you a huge emotional boost because you're like, now I'm building a thing. It makes people whether you interview them, whether they're customers, whether you're, they're your friends, even if people know it's fake, um, which you shouldn't tell them that it's fake. You should tell you you're building it right now because you are. Um, it makes everybody take you a billion times more seriously for absolutely no reason, just because they, they, they see that and they're like, aha. Um, so that's like, it's great for credibility. It's great for personal, just like emotional attachment to this thing and, and it motivates you. And third, it's a great way to actually test because if you market that landing page, that little website, and you send it to people trying to get them to buy the thing and they click on the buy button and it just goes to a little form like we said with the chicken bone broth thing, right? If you do that, um, now you have customers and now you can go and email those people because you have their emails and be like, hey, actually, we're, we're still early beta on the product. We'd love to like interview you and learn more about why you need this and what you need it for, et cetera. 
um, like that actually starts to get you in front of customers and put it on your LinkedIn too. 100% put like CEO, founder of blah, right? Do it. Like people, will, again, will take you way more seriously for absolutely no reason. Um, but yeah, so it's good for testing customers. It's good for your own personal investment and excitement in the product. And it's good for people taking you seriously, but just build a little website, make it look real, make it look like a thing and then have the button say, sign up beta now. And then the beta goes to a little form with an email, um, an email field. That is the number one thing by far that I would recommend to everybody. That's how I start every single little idea that I have. And that's how I recommend every student start theirs. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that sounds great. That is exactly what we're looking for. I think we're, we're running a little late on time here. Do you have like one last thing you want to leave everybody off with and just end it on that? I think Angela's question about like what um, you, uh, like what do you recommend everybody do is email people, 100% email people and then build things. And even if they're just little websites that pretend things exist, um, those are by far what I would recommend. Um, and really quick, Ben asked, what's the worst advice you see entrepreneurs consistently follow? That you need funding. Nobody needs funding. It nine, like 0.1% of companies need funding you don't need funding. I'm a hundred percent certain that you don't need funding. Um, just build things, try to find customers and get paid. If you can get paid through that. Then the funding will follow if you really, really truly need it. But I, none of the things that I ever will build will probably ever need funding and yours probably won't either. So don't worry about it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Max. That was awesome. That was yeah, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. That like really, it just shows the entrepreneurial life. Like the whole process of it, you know, that was really great. And I just want to let everyone know to please um, take the survey, the feedback survey. I just dropped it in the link. And so I just want to thank Max again. It was a great presentation. Heck yeah. Thank you so much. I'm glad. Thank you for letting me blab about essentially just my life for the past 70 minutes. Uh, thanks. Max, um, could you uh, drop in the chat your social media channels for us so we could follow you and subscribe? Awesome. Uh, and feel free to reach out to me um, at all uh, in any capacity everywhere. Um, I think that's at Instagram.com slash entrepreneur. Oh, it's not that. It's uh, entrepreneur underscore nerd. Um, sorry. Uh, entrepreneur underscore nerd. There's that. Uh, on TikTok, I'm at entrepreneur nerd. Um, LinkedIn is linkedin.com slash in slash Max Mirho, uh, twitch.tv slash entrepreneur underscore nerd, um, and then entrepreneur dot blog. I don't know why I just dropped like 17 links in the chat. Um, whatever, no pressure to follow me anywhere, but if you have any questions, pick your, you pick your poison and reach out to me in whatever way you think might be cool. So thank you so much for letting me blab. Awesome. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you. We really appreciate everything that you do for the Rack Innovation Lab. Of course. I appreciate everything you guys do for me. Awesome. Well, thank you so cool. much. <laughs> I'll see you all later. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.